All right, so we're going to learn about the cell cycle. So starting with the purpose of the cell cycle, um, that is for sexual and asexual reproduction, and then the details of the cell cycle, the three phases, the interphase, uh, mitosis, and the cytokinesis. Okay, so we're going to learn basically just one thing today. Starting with cells. Now, humans have trillions of cells in our body, not just billions, but trillions. A trillion is basically uh, 12 zeros. Okay, we have around 50 trillion cells. Depends on the person, because some people are bigger than others, but everyone started as one cell. Okay, we spent approximately 30 minutes as a single cell, and then it will divide to make two cells, and then four, and then eight, and so on, until we are who we are today. Now, where did those cells come from? Well, the first cell in your body was a fusion of a sperm and an egg from your parents. Okay, so basically, the cell's ability to divide and reproduce is extremely important. Uh, it is responsible for you being in class today. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. There are many reasons to divide, and the obvious one is for reproduction. Life has the unique properties to reproduce, to make offspring. So that is one of the criteria to be considered to be life. Now, inanimate objects like a rock or a chair, they are unable to reproduce, so they are not life. Okay, viruses, again, well, they can reproduce. They need the help of a foreign organism they cannot reproduce by themselves so that disqualifies viruses uh, for being life so when you reproduce parents are supposed to pass down genetic information to their offspring and offspring means kids so you resemble your biological parents to some extent it is not completely random all right, so probably your hair color, your skin color, your eyes, to some extent your height and other features somewhat resembles your parents. Okay, I'm talking about, of course, biological parents. It is, it's not impossible, but it's very rare for you to not have the same hair and eye color or skin color as your parents. It is a possibility. You'll learn about that in grade 11, but for all intents and purposes, you are very similar to your parents in many ways because you are a mixture of their genetic information. And in order to reproduce, uh, there are two strategies. Oh, what about grandparents? That's a good question. So you share 50% the same DNA as your both parents. So 50% from mom, 50% from dad, right? But you also have grandparents. Your parents also have parents. So think your mother. Your mother has two parents, grandma and grandpa. Your dad also has two parents, grandma and grandpa. And they gave 50% of their DNA to your parents. So you share a quarter. If you do the math, a half times a half is a quarter. You share a quarter of your DNA with each of your grandparents. Okay. Uh, if you look more like your grandmother than anyone, that actually makes a lot of sense because there are some traits that skip generations. As in your grandparents have it, your parents don't, but somehow when it gets to your generation, you have it again. Okay, that's very common. So you will learn more about that in grade 11 biology when you learn about Mendelian uh, genetics. And you can see how some traits tend to skip generations. So yeah, that makes perfect sense. Oh, well, thank you for your comment. Okay, so uh, reproduction strategies. If you want to reproduce, you need to do two things. Well, one of two things. One, you can do it by yourself, okay? Cut yourself in half or just grow another limb and call it another being. That is asexual reproduction. Asexual means without sex. Or you can get a partner. Okay, you can reproduce with another organism of the same species. So that would be sexual reproduction. Both of this, uh, both of which are viable strategies. But first, 
asexual reproduction. Basically, some organisms like bacteria, plants, they can make copies of themselves. All right, so a bacteria can straight up just cut itself in half. Now you have two. And those two can now cut themselves in half. Now you have four. And this doubling is very fast. So the bacteria can grow very quickly, So which is why an infection can get pretty dangerous pretty fast because bacteria reproduce. Plants do the same thing. Plants can make a genetic copy of itself. Um, there are many ways to do that. And one of the ways I showed was basically just started growing a daughter plant, but that plant is connected to the parent plant. So technically they're still the same plant, uh, but that is like a sexual reproduction. Now you have almost two plants, okay? Now, asexual reproduction has a lot of advantages. It is very safe. It's very easy to do. You need yourself and some nutrients. That's pretty much it, okay? And it's not dangerous. You're not at risk of being killed. You're not at risk of not finding a partner. So you can always do it when the time comes. So it's very convenient. I'm surprised that most animals don't do that. Well, and then there's the other strategy, um, sexual reproduction. Um, is asexual like sperm donor? No, no, no. That's sexual reproduction. If you go to the sperm bank and decide to raise a kid without a father, but you still need sperm. That, that came from another person. So you do need another person, okay? Whether you have sex doesn't matter. You can do in vitro fertilization. You can fertilize the egg in a petri dish. It doesn't matter. Okay. Sexual refers to the union of two gametes, and, and a gamete is sperm and eggs. Those are called gametes. As long as they came from another being, not just yourself, that would be sexual reproduction. Okay. So animals mostly do sexual reproduction. There are, again, advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are you get more variety. You're not making clones of yourselves. If you're a bacteria, and whoa, did you just zoom in my computer? If you're a bacteria, you can reproduce by making a clone of yourself, but that is still a clone of yourself. You're the same thing. There is no variety. If a virus comes and it targets you, then all of your clones will be susceptible you're, because you're the same thing. You will all die. So that's bad, which is why sexual reproduction is so great. Because when you mix your DNA with someone else, you increase the amount of variety in the population. So one virus wouldn't kill everyone. It will just kill those that are susceptible. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, okay, I'm having questions here. Uh, okay, um, yeah, no, same-sex relationships, they're, that you can't really reproduce. You see what I mean? If you're in a same-sex relationship and you want a biological child, you're going to have to find someone of the opposite sex. And a lot of same-sex couples tend to do that. Um, they donate their own biological material, get a surrogate parent, and then raise a biological child. Now, obviously, um, that can't come from both parents because they're the same sex. So that, that is one unfortunate thing about having a same-sex relationship. If you want to have a biological child from both parents, that's not actually possible. But same-sex couples do have kids, and that's one of the ways. But that is still sexual reproduction. Okay, remember, as long as there are two individuals involved, they both donated a gamete, one sperm, one egg, that is sexual. Asexual is you don't need anyone. If everyone else on earth dies, and this is the only thing left, it can still reproduce, that will be asexual. Okay? All right, so... 
there are many disadvantages towards sexual reproduction. If you think about it, it's kind of hard to find someone. What if you don't find someone? In fact, a lot of males in the animal world don't reproduce because they are unable to find females. Okay. Or it can be very dangerous if you're committing to sexual reproduction. While you're in the act, you're defenseless. A predator could stalk you and basically kill you on the spot. You see what I mean? And some organisms even suffer health-wise from a sexual reproduction, like the cliche mantis, the male gets their head bitten off after reproducing. So those are some disadvantages. It's hard to find somebody. And you have to go through all this trouble to make that person like you. This is not just for humans, by the way. Animals do much the same. Insects, the males sometimes will go and grab, I don't know, another fly if you're carnivorous, wrap it up, give it to the female as a gift. Okay, so you have to woo the females. That, that, that takes a lot of effort. You have to spend energy to hunt. If you're not successful, you might even get hurt. So w why are we doing this? Well, the, the benefits of genetic variety is way too high. So that's why sexual reproduction is a viable strategy. All right, so um, hold on. There's a lot of comments. Uh, what are you guys talking about? Cancer. AIDS. Uh, I mean. Okay, so it started like I asked if uh -huh. uh, one parent had, like the sperm donor, had a disease. Uh -huh. Would it like be would it be carried to it the kid? Depends. It depends on which disease. Some diseases are heritable. That means you can pass it down to the kids, like HIV. If parents have HIV, their kids will have HIV. Okay, and also some genetic diseases. If there is something wrong with your DNA, like we talked about last class, genetic disorders. If you have um, Huntington's disease, that's something directly wrong with your DNA, you have a probability, not 100%, 50% of passing that down. Also color blindness, if you're red, green, colorblind, you're probably a male, first of all, females is really rare to be red, green, colorblind. You have a high chance of passing that to your kids, especially your sons, okay? So, but not all diseases. For example, if you if you have cancer, that is not heritable, okay? It, if a person with cancer reproduces, the child will be cancer-free. Now, the probability of getting cancer, because some people have a higher risk for getting cancer, and that can be genetic, that can be passed on, but that is not, you know, the cancer itself is it, the risk is. Uh, what about, what is that called, BRCA? I don't know what that is, or C. Oh, oh, okay. Now, genes are passed on, yes, so that would be passed on. As long as it's genetic, if you have the genetics that make you more susceptible for cancer, then yeah, that can be passed on. Similarly, if you have good genetics, that can also be passed on. So only if it's genetic, because not a lot of diseases are genetic. Uh, if you lose an arm in an accident, that doesn't matter. You, it wouldn't be passed on. Does that make sense? All right, so let's uh, move on. Uh, okay, so um, another reason for cell division is to grow. Now, after you grow, you get bigger, and that can be disadvantageous. If you're too big, then it will be very difficult for you to get nutrients for all of your body mass. Does that make sense? Especially if you look at the picture. If you are a small cube, and how does a cell get nutrients? Well, from its cell membrane, its surface, its outside. If you have a small volume, you have a relatively big surface for nutrients to go in, so you're fine. Now, if you grow really big, you have a large volume, so thus you will require more nutrients, but your surface area doesn't grow as fast as your volume. Remember in math class, Volume 
is cubic, is something cubed. And surface area is something squared. Cube is bigger than square. So as the individual grows, the volume grows faster than the surface area. There will come a time where you don't have enough skin to suck in enough nutrients to sustain your mass. And that's why insects are typically small because they breathe through their skin, okay? And if insects are too big, they won't have enough skin to get enough oxygen for all of its body. That, that, that's a good thing for humans because that would be very creepy, but back in the past where oxygen level was much higher, insects were the size of people, okay? But we didn't exist back then, but we found fossils of insects that large, and that explains it. Okay, um, mental illness. Oh, yeah, see, they, those are hard questions. As long as it's genetic, the answer is yes. The question is, are they genetic? Okay, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, maybe some people do, but as long as if it's genetic, it can, you have a higher probability of passing it down. Okay, so anyway, so that's why when a cell gets too large, it will have to divide. Otherwise, you're not, you're too big, you can't get enough nutrients. Okay, does that make sense? So like I said, volume goes faster than the surface area, so you need more skin. By dividing, you reduce your volume and you increase your surface area. So now you're more efficient. So that's another reason. Cells cannot get too big. And three, if you get hurt, your cells will heal you by reproducing, okay? And about every hour or so, a billion of your cells die. Okay? But you don't drop dead because you are replacing those cells when they die, okay? So in fact, you replace your cells once every few years completely. Okay? So you, a few years ago, are you really you today because you share zero cells with that person in the past? You see what I mean? You slowly get replaced because cells don't live forever. And if you cut yourself, then that wound heals because the cells around it will reproduce to make new ones. And your blood as well, you replace your blood in every three months. You break a bone, you break a skin. Again, cell division is important because A, you grow, to reproduce, and three, you repair, okay? Um, dead cells, the same as dead hair cells and nail cells. Well, first of all, um, hair, you're talking about the follicle, and the hair itself is not made of cells. Uh, nails are protein, so, so is hair, so they're not the same thing, but skin cells, yes. Uh, you're, when you take a shower and you rub and things come off, well, those are your dead cells. Okay, dust. If you accumulate dust somewhere, those are the dead cells of some organism. Probably you. Okay, yeah. So yeah, that's why when you scrub, things come off. Not because you're dirty. You don't even have to roll in mud. Your cells would die and just come off. You get new ones. Okay, so the cell cycle. This is what makes all of this possible cell division. So a cell goes through a cycle like many things in this world. Uh, we go through cycles all the time, like even in school, there's a cycle, first period, second period, third period, fourth period. So the cell goes through a cycle. It has a life stage, just like you guys. You're born, you get old, you die. So cells go through interphase, mitosis, and then the last cycle, cytokinesis. And we're going to look at what happens in each of these stages. Okay, in the diagram, you can see that it splits up even more. You have the G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase. And then in that slice that is magnified, you have the M phase. That's mitosis, that's cell division. And then after that, you have cytokinesis, and then you have the G1, S, and G2 again. And I'll explain what those are. So step one, you have interphase, so interphase is the longest phase of the cell's life. And interphase is so long, it is divided into three smaller phases. So what happens? Well, during interphase, 
G1 specifically, you copy everything, okay? Because, you know, cells need to divide. And when you divide, you need to make a copy of everything that you have, evenly split it, and then you have two new cells. Otherwise, if you don't do this, every time you divide, you lose half of your stuff, that will quickly result in something like really bad. If you split up, you need all of your belongings. Okay, so that's why you need to make a copy. G1 does that. All the organelles, the mitochondria, you make a copy. The ER, you make a copy, okay? The vacuoles, you make a copy. Everything, you make a copy, except DNA. Because DNA is copied during the S phase. DNA is such a large molecule, there is, there is a dedicated phase just to copy DNA. You reproduce the DNA so that it is exactly the same as what you have. So now you have two copies. When you divide, you both take one. And then lastly, the G2 phase is like, let me double check before I go ahead with this. Let me check I have two of everything first because you want to make sure. So that's for that. And you get ready for cell division. That's interface. So basically, in interphase, your cells prepare for cell division, and you grow, and you carry out your everyday functions, just like you. You're either reproducing or you're not reproducing. Most of the time, you're not reproducing. Even the people that gave birth like at a world record level, most of the time, they're not reproducing. How many kids can you have in your life, right? And even if you have like 30 kids, well, that is only 30 instances where you have to do that in your whole life. So most of your life is you just living your life, doing your everyday activities, waking up, eating, just keeping yourself alive. That's basically what the cell does as well. So that's why interphase is the longest because cells don't spend all of their time reproducing. Okay, next. The next phase. So when you do reproduce, that is mitosis. Okay, mitosis is only a small fraction of a cell's life, but there are four distinct phases here, and you need to remember the names of these phases, what happens in them, and the order in which they occur. So here in this one slide, it summarizes interphase plus mitosis. Okay, so I'm going to have to go through each of these stages and explains uh, explain what happened. So again, it's color coded. Those little uh, bunny ear looking things, they're chromosomes, as we learned before. The color pink is for mother, a green is for father. So you, you can see that it's 50-50. You have half from mom, half from dad, and they divide. Okay, so chromosomes. Let's review chromosomes. We learned this in the previous lesson. DNA will condense and coil and organize itself into a chromosome, which kind of looks like an X, okay? A chromatid, okay, so there's a small difference in spelling here. A chromatid is only one of the two identical strands. If you look at the picture, that giant X, on the left side, that is one strand. On the right side, it's another strand. They're attached in the middle with something called a centromere. Each of these strands are exactly the same because you made a copy. You have to make a copy because you're dividing, right? So you make a copy of everything you have and chromosomes make a copy of itself and they attach with itself in the center, which is called the centromere. Okay, so the centromere is a structure that holds the chromosome together in the middle. So each individual arm are chromatids. The whole thing, the X, is a chromosome. So please make sure you know which is which. These words can be confusing, uh, but this picture, I believe, helps. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, good, good. Let's move on. And like I said before, humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, okay? Pairs. Notice that these aren't connected in the middle like the previous side. Look, previous side is connected. These ones, they're not connected. You're only connected when you make a copy of yourself, 
because you're ready to divide and then you connect yourself these ones they're not gonna divide yet so they, they didn't make a copy of themselves so we have 46 chromosomes when we're about to divide the number of chromosomes double right because you have to make a copy we have 92 after mitosis after the whole thing is done you have two cells that are exactly identical guess what they both have 46 chromosomes again just like you're supposed to so you double you split up into two okay, that's quite important so prophase is the first phase in mitosis in the first stage many things happen okay one the dna will condense into chromosomes dna normally is kind of messy only when you're dividing do they come into these nicely organized structure called chromosomes in the picture that giant blob of redness in the middle that's a normal dna in interface when you're trying to divide you organize it into these little cute x's chromosomes it's like when you move you, you buy a new house you want to move in you pack your stuff right you put them in nice little boxes so that the moving company can haul them over when you're not moving your stuff are not in little boxes it's everywhere in your home so that it's convenient kind of the same thing here so dna condenses to chromosomes it gets ready to be shipped second the nuclear envelope breaks down. Remember our, uh, the first lesson? Nuclear envelope is the membrane that holds the nucleus. It is like the Parliament Hill building. Okay, It has brick walls to prevent things from going in, to prevent things from coming out. Now, during cell division, the walls come down. The nuclear envelope disappears because the DNA needs to come out and separate so you break the walls down third there are things called centrosomes not centromeres a centromere is the thing that holds chromosomes together in the middle like a cross but a centrosome is that green thing in the cell if you take a uh, note uh, take a look at each of these cells they have these green vegetable looking things i don't know how to, that looks like a chopped up asparagus okay those are centrosomes they move to the opposite ends of the cell why because these fibers these little strings called spindle fibers start to grow from them and they attach themselves to the centromere the middle of every single chromosome like the third picture Okay, yeah, a lot of things just happen here in one phase, the prophase. That's the most complicated phase. DNA is organized into chromosomes. The walls come down. The nuclear envelope breaks down. The centrosomes, the green things, move to the two ends of the cell. And spindle fiber attaches to the DNA in the middle. Okay, it, it, imagine this like... You're trying to move, okay? You pack your stuff, that's DNA condensing. The walls come down, they demolish your house. Okay, you don't do that when you move, but you know, imagine your house is being demolished. They totally destroy your home. Moving trucks come, those are the centrosomes, and this, the fibers, they attach them to your stuff and they haul it away. Okay, so that's profit. The next phase is much simpler. Line it up in the middle. The chromosomes line up at the center, we call it the equator of the cell, in one very straight line. That's it. This is metaphase, okay? Why? Well, because now when you're neatly lined up, you start to pull in both directions. So the spindle fibers in anaphase, the third stage, they start to contract and they pull apart the chromosomes. They're attached together by the centromere, but now they pull apart. So now identical copies of DNA 
moves to the different poles of the cell. Okay, does that make sense? It's like getting a divorce. You take half, I take half. We split up, we go our separate ways. And next, since we've split up, we now live in different houses. So the nuclear envelope comes back. Okay, DNA needs to live inside the nucleus. We destroy the nucleus in order to split them up. And now that we have split up, the nucleus comes back. The nuclear envelope reforms. The chromatids, they don't need to be chromatids anymore. They can just unravel and become normal DNA. And this is telophase. The formation of two different nuclei, but you can see in the picture, the I mean, the two cells are still kind of attached. They're not two separate cells yet, but this is telophase. Two nuclei in one single cell on its way of splitting up. Okay, so do we have any questions so far? No? Alrighty. Last step. Cytokinesis. Let me just saw that real quick. The cytoplasm of the cell, um, which is just the, the body of the cell, will split up into two different cells. That's it. That's cytokinesis right there. In animal cells, it's very simple to do. You just kind of pinch off. Okay? You, it's like you take a rubber band and you take a balloon and you wrap the rubber band in the middle of the balloon and it will pinch the balloon into two. And that's how you do cytokinesis. Now you have two identical daughter cells. In a plant, it's a little bit more complicated because plants have something that animals don't. They have walls. They have cell walls. So in order for the two cells to completely separate, they need to build a wall at the border and have the other cell pay for it. Well, no, they both pay for it. So they have to build a cell wall to officially separate the two cytoplasms. So in animal and plants, it's different. Figure A on the left, animals, oh, you just have to split them up. But in B, you build a wall. Now you have two smaller but identical daughter cells. They're exactly the same as the parents, except they're now smaller. So they now need time to grow to become bigger again and hopefully divide again. So they will go back into interphase and it will stay in interphase for a long time until it is ready to divide again and the process will repeat. So here is a real image. This is a real photograph dyed with different inks so that you can see the chromosomes better and the spindle fiber. So in the first picture you have interphase you can see that the spindle fibers are kind of everywhere and the nucleus is very clearly intact. You can see like red blobs in there, that's the DNA. In prophase, you can see that the DNA kind of splits into little noodles or like worms and the spindle fibers start to come out. You can see that at the two ends of the nucleus, you have little fibers coming out like hair. That's prophase, you're ready. Metaphase, you can clearly physically see that all of them are lined up in the middle. Anaphase, you start to pull apart. Uh, that's the bottom right. And telophase, you have two separate nuclei, and then they start to divide. They go back into interphase. Um, can I please go back to the anaphase slide? Sure. Um, this one. Do you have a question? No, sorry, I just forgot to take the note for... Okay, no problem. I think it's like one word, right? All right, we good? Gonna move on. All right, so this is it. I'm gonna show you a video that summarizes this. So basically today we learned the cell cycle, why cells need to reproduce, well, to reproduce, to grow and to repair. There's sexual versus asexual reproduction, um, but both of which transfers genetic information from parent to offspring. It's just that asexual, you do it by yourself, so you make a clone. Sexual, you need a partner. You need two gametes 
from different individuals. Sperm, egg. It doesn't matter where you get the sperm, where you get the egg, as long as you get it from someone else. Okay, so, and then there's mitosis, um, the four phases, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then you go into cytokinesis, you break, and then interphase, and you start this all over again. Any questions? Okay. I'm going to stop the recording, first of all.